All right. Well, thanks, Eric. Appreciate that. We are uh, here, as you as you know, talking about these 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 paywalls. It's been kind of a love hate relationship for many years, as uh, publishers are trying to decide what to do in an environment that is increasingly more harsh towards um, sustainability. And I come at this as an outsider. I'm not a journalist. I'm a software developer. And we, we had a media company come to us back in 2008 as we were doing web development and e-commerce. And they were wanting to put up a paywall. And we were like, well, that's interesting. Um, and so as we began to learn more about, oh, get a little feedback there. As we're beginning to learn more about what their business was, uh, we looked in and so we, we saw a number of newspapers and print organizations out there really struggling to make the transition to the digital market. And so uh, that's where it began for us. We began to have more conversations with different publishers around the country as we begin to build out the platform. And I began to really sense the emotion and the pain that was coming from uh, you know, the, the publishers and, and the new, new executives as they said, as they said, you know, we've been in this for decades and we don't know what to do. You know, we don't know really what to do. And I've seen all the experiments. Uh, Eric mentioned a number of experiments that have been made. And so what I'm sharing with you today is I'm going to share, share with you a few success stories. But I also want to talk a little bit about how paywalls fit within the context of the open web and how they can work together in balance. Because an, extreme, because an extreme to one side or the other is not good. We want to have balance. So let's start with what the open web is. The year of the open web began back in 2017. Obviously, there have been many years that came before that, that kind of started to build the foundation for the year of the open web. And it continues on into this year, and I imagine that it's going to continue on in, for, for years to come. And you can learn more about uh, this at yearofopen.org. They work collaboratively, collaboratively to define various uh, initiatives. But Mark Sermon said this. He's uh, the executive of, executive of the Mozilla uh, Corporation, or Foundation, rather. He said, the open web is a sweeping term. It encompasses technical concepts like open source code, open standards. It also encompasses democratic concepts like free expression and digital inclusion. But there's a single underlying principle connecting all these ideas. An open web is a web by and for all its users, not select gatekeepers or governments. And I could really, I can, I can connect with that. You know, the language there reminds me a little, it kind of, you know, like a small statement coming out of, you know, the Gettysburg Address. The government, you know, by the people, of the people, for the people. So we see that, that, that concept there, and it's a good concept. Now, some will argue that change, or charging rather, for access to news content, in other words, you know, subscription models and, pay, and being gatekeepers, goes against the idea of the open web. Now, Jonah Peretti last year in October did an interview, and he said that the subscription model does not support informing a broad audience. While not providing necessarily a strong solution for media and the, a media industry struggling to make it on the back of ad, ad revenues, he did say this. He said that Google and Facebook are going to have to fix this problem. It's not tenable that only people getting quality news will be only 2 or 5 or even 20% of the public. Now, what's he really saying? As you dig down a little bit further, what he's saying is Google and Facebook need to do better at sharing their ad revenues back with the media organizations that they're making their money off of, right? And I, you know, when I talk to publishers, they said, yeah, it would be nice if we can get a little bit more. But the problem that, that the dilemma that we have here is that it's still on the back, it, it's still advertising, which is an indirect monetization model of your core business. So fundamentally, the problem in advertising, uh, you know, it doesn't, 
it's not meeting the needs. It's not filling the financial revenue gaps that are being created because ad dollars just aren't what they used to be. Now, these platforms like Google and Facebook and various others are trying to move in to the uh, news markets and provide solutions, especially local and hyperlocal. But they're not doing a quality or, or, or an effective job um, you know, with their solutions. They just don't have the boots on the ground like people in the community. They don't have the relationships. They don't have the connections. They don't have that, you know, the, the people who are on the ground doing the work and making the connections. Well, Google has recognized this. It's interesting. Google, in the wake of the fake, of fake news and a quality de deficit in the content, uh, has actually began reversing its original policies that penalized paid content uh, versus free content. As you all know, that if you had a paywall or some sort of, maybe some of you know, but as you have a paywall or some sort of paid model, there were certain penalties, certain things that you didn't you know, didn't rank as well in that sort of thing in certain areas. But notice what the vice president of Google News, Richard Gingras, said. Uh, and this was just this year. So this is kind of encouraging, and it's, it's interesting. Advertising alone can no longer pay for high-quality journalism. So it's a pretty powerful figure making that statement. And it's true. Even this year, in Mar uh, just a couple months ago, there was an interview that jo um, Jonah Peretti made and he said this, he uh, kind of changed his tone a little bit, and he says a partial paywall for BuzzFeed could make sense. So it's interesting, you know, just a, just a few months, just last year, um, you know, he, he was pretty strong, made some strong statements against it, but he's kind of seeing maybe there's a balance that we could find in setting up direct monetization models for our content. Now, I respect the fact that Google um, you know, recognizes the quality deficit, but it's naive for them to think that they can swoop in and be in an effective solution for these news organizations. And you'll notice I, I, I constantly refer to local and hyperlocal. I know there are probably some bigger organizations here, but we have seen, uh, you know, the paid content models, paywalls and things work really well for the local markets because they really have something unique. Um, and, and there's not as much competition. There's still competition, but there's not as much competition. And, and there's, there's that uniqueness in their content that they have. So the open web sets up a framework, a framework for openness that we can all agree is a good, is a good thing. But it doesn't yet address the needs that legitimate content generators of the world have. There needs to be a balance. So what are the pain points that print uh, publishers have, newspapers and, and uh, magazines and so on. What are the pain points? Now, these pain points are, are many, and sadly, over the years, especially during 2008, 2009 uh, recession, we saw many uh, newspapers, had, they, had to shut, sh they had to shut down, or they had to cut back you know, quite a bit on their staff. And so that was, a, that was a tough time for the news industry. But let's take a look at a few. So decades ago, we had new mediums like the radio and TV coming onto the scene, um, which challenged the print medium, yet the print medium was still able to hold its own. The internet was a mixed bag. It could hurt or help, uh, depending on how quickly these print organizations adopted the, the digital medium. Then we have Craigslist and Facebook, which virtually have dried up classified res revenues. And then digital ad revenues just aren't making up for the print, ab print avenue losses. Okay, so the first two uh, bullet points here really are just mediums, okay? Medium changes, consumption medium changes, you know? And I think the second one, newspapers could and should really dominate in because you guys have the backbone, and I say dominate in the best sense of the term, but you guys have the journalism backbone, you have the, the reporters, you have the connections, and this is a, a medium right up your alley. And there have been many who've done an excellent job in making the jump to digital, but there are many who are still struggling. But I'd say arguably the biggest pain point for media organizations today is in the realm of ad revenues and advertising. They just have plummeted. They're not, they are not what they used to be. I remember someone telling me that if you drink too much carrot juice, you're going to turn orange. And I laughed it off. I thought it, was, I thought it was comical. But then I met 
a woman who was juicing, and that woman was Oompa Loompa Orange. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. And so I got curious. I looked it up. I found out that uh, vitamin A in, too many, to, in large quantities can actually damage your liver. Well, of course, vitamin A, beta carotene, you know, it comes from the carrot juice. So this, I, I don't think this lady was, was overdoing it, but she certainly was orange. But what I'm trying to get at is too much of even a good thing is bad. So we have to have balance. We have to find that balance. And, you know, there is science. There are numbers that you know, you're going to see me put up a little bit. You've seen some numbers from Eric here. And there is definitely a science, but I also believe that some of it is a little bit of an art. And there's a, there's a little bit of experimentation and playing around and, and knowing your audience, knowing your community, and finding out what is, what is it that they value about you, what is, it, what is it that your market can bear, and so on. So case in point, advertising. Too much of a good thing? Too much of a bad thing? Is it good? Is it bad? You know, in the context of purchasing, I don't mind ads so much. If I'm going to the store and I'm shopping and I see an ad or something like that, now, honestly, I don't do a lot of shopping. My wife does most of the shopping. But when I do go, um, you know, it's the Apple store or it's Home Depot. That's where I go. But I like seeing the ads. I like seeing the deals. And I want to find out what's going on. So advertising in the context of purchasing is welcomed in most cases. Even uh, shopping online, Amazon.com, eBay, those kinds of things, advertising usually is not, you know, not something that, that is, is, is frowned upon. But when people are not in the context of purchasing, we're in, when they're in the context of consuming news or, or information and that sort of thing, advertising is a little bit more annoying. It's a little bit out of context. And so this is that dilemma that publishers have is presenting ads in a way that is relevant and important, but not invasive, all right? So um, the two complaints I hear the most from readers, um, from, from our, our clients' readers, is that either the ads are just too distracting or they're way too many. They're just way too many. I'm not in the right mindset when I'm reading a long-form article to have a full-page ad blow up in my face and I have to sit there and wait to close the ad. It's an invasive ad. It's improper design, ad design, I believe. What's more, this ad, when it blows up and fills the entire screen, often changes the scroll of the screen. And so once I click it, I have to then scroll back down and try to find where I was reading. And this is invasive. This frustrates me. And I know it frustrates many other users. And it's a problem. And so there needs to be better ad design, more relevant ads, and not so invasive. So when the timing is right, when the context makes sense, ads are normally welcome. And in the context of reading, it needs to be balanced and not so much. Now, a YouGov report commissioned by Upstream shows, this, uh, shows that in 1997, back in the early days, that user and everybody was clicking on everything. User engagement was at 7% for online advertising. All right? Well, that's not too bad. But by, when you get down to 2012, this had fallen to 0.1%, 0.1%. And I, ve I venture to guess that if a, a recent study was done, it would be somewhere around that, that or worse. People are simply learning to overlook online ads. That's it. We have gotten good at, uh, at overlooking them. And to add insult to injury, we have the uh, era of ad blockers which are just, you know, people don't even see the ads, so it's not even a problem anymore. Anyways, so this only compounds the dilemma for ad revenues for publishers. So think about it. If I were to give you guys $1 on the condition that you guys would give me $7 back, would you do it? Well, maybe, well maybe, maybe somebody's generous out there. If you like me, really, and you really you know, are altruistic, said, sure, I'll do it. But no, most cases, it doesn't make sense, OK? So check this out. The Pew Research Center's Project for Excellence in Journalism did a study on digital revenues for thir across 38 different newspaper publishers. Now, for every dollar gained in digital advertising for these publishers, they lost $7 in, digital, or in print advertising. So that is a big hit. If you're used to having $700,000 in ad revenue, depending on your side, maybe it's 
70,000, whatever it may be, if you're used to that and it drops to 100,000, what would that do to your business? That would hurt. That would hurt really, really, really bad. So we have seen that advertising is good when carefully done. But overdone, it only drives you, your readers and your core business, and with the, the, who you are and what you do, it turns them off because of the advertising. So you have to be careful with that. You know, and this kind of report is all too familiar for publishers and newspaper executives. They're looking at the financial statements coming across their desk. In short, the early dot-com boom days, online advertising seemed like the holy grail. Okay, it was the financial holy grail. There was no limit to space. We could throw up as many ads as possible. We can take pages and break them down into clicks. You know, let's put, take one article and get 10 clicks out of it. You know, so we could throw more ads for every pagination that is done on that article. And so we, 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 we saw that was kind of the trend and we'll just put it up for free. We won't charge anything to our customers. We will put it all in the back of advertising. It didn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And I'm not putting down, I don't want to put down advertising. Again, my goal here is to bring balance and perspective. Advertising is good, but the way it has been done in the past, and even is being done today, is, is too much or, or in, you know, it's just not working. So the digital, avenue, red ad, <laughs> digital ad revenues just aren't growing as fast as the loss in print ad, ad revenues. We've seen that advertising revenues have dropped. They are dropping. And the, 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 you know, typically most organizations, print organizations, will use advertising as the horse that pulls the cart, but it's just not strong enough to pull a cart anymore in many cases. And so what I suggest to organizations is start switching things around. Start allowing your customers, your core business, journalism, to be the horse that pulls the cart. Let advertising take a back seat, not completely get rid of it, but let, let's kind of shift the paradigm a little bit and bring some balance to this and let your community, who you serve, bear the weight a little bit of, of your business. So, check this out. The subscription economy is here. Now, like I kind of I underscored at the beginning, there are different types of experiments going on for paywalls and micropayments and different ways for, for, make, for purchasing access to your content. And I, I don't know, I just know that there, there's a trend. I can look at the trends and see what's kind of working for most organizations. And until we find you know, the, the perfect formula, we're gonna to have to continue experimenting. But the fact is, folks, people are getting more and more used to subscribing to stuff. It's just become a part of our society, thanks to the likes of you know, Netflix and, and Spotify, Pandora, and, and whatever subscription service that is out there. People are getting used to it. Reuters reported in 2017 that there was a year-over-year -year increase in customers paying directly for online news, not just in the young age demographic, but in all age demographics. Even the older folks are getting on the bandwagon and pulling out the card, using Apple Pay, Google Pay, whatever it is to get access to the news or the, 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 the digital magazines, e-editions and that sort of thing. I'm not a big e-edition person, but I have some older relatives who just have to have that e-edition experience. It's that print to e-edition. But, you know, that's, that, that, those are offerings that are available. So the subscription economy is here. Consumers are realizing that they do get what they pay for, and so they're pulling out the cards. But how can publishers charge for access and not feel guilty that they're breaking some sort of unspoken or developing open web rule? You know, how can they feel that their charging for access isn't going, to, going against this open web ideology? Well, let's take a look at media organizations and the open web. Are media organizations bad because they want to charge for content directly? Let's look at this logically. The roles of media organizations can be summed up in two different ways. You have content creators, and then you have content reporters. 
Okay? So let's look at it this way. It's entirely up to the content creators, you know, people like musicians and writers and software developers to determine how they want to distribute their original creation. All right? That's, that's, that's up to them. It's their idea. It's their original creation. And many of them are perfectly happy to put it out there for free for the community to contribute back to, to offer us as, as um, kind of an incentive for something else. But it's important to note that these creators must have some commercial aspect or some monetization model in their life in order for them to continue to create. It's just a fact of life. There has to be a monetization factor. And so how do we address this when it comes to the publishers and media organizations of the world? You think about this. Even Mr. Mullenweg has WordPress.com. It's his commercial hosting platform. Yes, it uses the open source WordPress uh, software, but does that hinder? the open source community because he has this commercial business on the back of something that he developed? No, I think it contributes. It puts back into it. He's able to actually add value to the open source project because of his commercial aspect. Now, he didn't just put everything behind a wall, but he gave some, and yet he does have a business on the back of it. And notice it's a service business as well. And if the content is too expensive or if it's no good, if it's poor quality, you know, the market will let you know. They'll stop subscribing, they'll stop paying, and they won't come back. And that's where you have to, re you know, do some heart searching. Is what we have really bringing value? Now, the second uh, role in uh, content is content or news reporting, a.k.a. journalism, okay? This is an entirely different aspect of media organizations and should stay far, far, far away from content creation or news creation, I should say. Imagine your re regional newspaper having a news creation department with roles like vehicle crash coordinator or game thrower or worse yet, the obituary team. Now, this kind of, this kind of, these kind of departments could get people into some serious trouble. I kid you not, we had a client, um, a regional a publisher of a regional daily, who told me that uh, there was a lady who called in and she said, I really like the obituaries, but I was wondering, is there any way you can add more? <laughs> uh, sure, we'll get right on that. So you can, imagine, you, <laughs> you can imagine the obituary news creation team. Hey, Tony, we need more obits. The content gener generated from news reporting is already an open source, all right? And this is, you know, this, seem, this paradigm shift seems really simple, and it's like, but it's amazing how many times I have to explain this and, like, point this out in conversations with people. It's anyone can gather the news information. Anybody can go to the corner and, and see what happened. Anybody can kind of, now granted, I know there's, there's a thing with, you know, kind of the press passes and things like that. There's certain access that press does have. But for the most part, news is an open source. And anybody can go and gather the news. But who wouldn't want, wouldn't you rather want to pay for a professional journalist to go and gather the news, a photographer to get pictures, to vet the story, to edit the story, publishers to publish it and make sure it's all delivered in a nice, simple package to read? I'd much rather do that in the same way that I would, I would venture to guess that many people would rather pay a web development company to download WordPress as an open source project and set it up for their media organiza organization rather than do it themselves. Okay, so you can see the comparison. WordPress, open source project, wonderful project. And, but in most cases, you guys are paying a development company to set it up and maintain it and help you support it, okay? So the sh we need to shift the value proposition off of the content and to the service, okay? When we do that, then this all begins to make more sense, okay? So it's perfectly within the context of open web standards for news reporting agencies to charge for their service, okay? When we look at it that way, oh, we're not putting a paywall, a paywall for our content, we're putting up a paywall for our 
service. Because you got to pay for reporters, you got to pay for photographers, you got to pay for editors, you got to pay for all these things. See? So news reporting organizations don't have to feel guilty charging for access to their content because what's being paid for is really the service. And that's where the value is. Just the same way that uh, web developer, development organizations don't have to feel bad for making a buck for setting up a WordPress media site. Okay? So quality and value should be the focus. And when you focus on the quality and the value, the clicks will come, the views will come, and subsequently, the revenues will come from your community. But if you're not asking for revenue, if, you're not, if you don't have a monetization model on direct, directly on your core business, your journalism or your, your, your site, if you're not asking for it, you're not going to receive it. You know? People aren't altruistic enough to call up and say, hey, we just want to support local news. Can we send you some money? You, know, you have to have something in place. And in most cases, there, we've come across some different organizations. We've set up some who are... I uh, kind of follow the donation-based model. And I've seen it kind of work. But most of the time when people are coming to the site, they read the article, they see the little prompt to donate, and they just kind of, it's like an ad, you know. But if there is a hard stop along the way, and I'm not saying a hard paywall, but a hard stop during doing some sort of metered or uh, kind of uh, type of scenario, people are going to say, well, I do value this. I'm going to have to go ahead and pull out the card and pay, you know. And we've seen that happen. So the news um, is 100% free. We, we talked about that. So paywalls and the open web. How do paywalls fit in the context of open web? An online-only news organization came to us about a year ago. They were in business for about six or seven years, roughly. And they said they had built a great following. They had a really uh, engaged uh, list, email list. They were doing like a newsletter two or three times a week. Uh, strong engagement in, in social, and, but they said, we just can't survive on the back of advertising. It was, it's just not happening. And basically, we have about nine months left of runway. If we don't see any change, we can't keep going on. On top of that, we would really love to add a reporter for some sports and do a couple other things, but we just don't, it's not there. We can't pull the, the number of advertisers we need. So we set up a paywall for them. And when the paywall went up, it was interesting some of the feedback they got. There's always complainers. You're going to get somebody, you're always going to get somebody, oh, you know, why are you charging for, for access now? But they had a number of people who replied and says, it's about time. We were wondering when were you going to start charging for your content? The people valued their service so much. And, uh, you know, and so they, they did really well. As a matter of fact, for a hyper local market that they were in, kind of a small media organization, they now have six figures of, of uh, annual revenue that they didn't have before they set up a paywall. And so today they're in business because they decided to allow their community to support them. Did they give up on advertising? No, no they didn't. As a matter of fact, they did see a 10% drop in traffic. But here's what the publisher said. I asked them, I said, so how, how has your ad strategy changed post paywall. And they've been in this going on about a year now. He said, the paywall's major impact on our ad strategy is that it allowed us to get rid of a lot of the most annoying ad slots on the site so that user experience was better. Even if, if the paywall only does that, that's worth it. You know, off, allowing your community to support you enough to where you can get rid of the annoying, the, the stuff that, you know, you make some money, but it's just annoying and you really, you, you, you want to hate it. He also said, uh, continuing on, the paywall gives us the leeway not to pursue bad ad, ad options. That is, advertisers that aren't local or ads that are obnoxious to readers. So, and they're doing, they're doing great. And they, they continue to grow their subscription business on, on a daily basis. So should content, creating, uh, content create, creating or reporting agencies implement a paywall across the board? Should everybody do it? In my opinion, it makes sense that businesses should have some direct form of monetization on their core business, you know, even in part, if it's just a little bit, you know, some sort of method that people can actually contribute to your business for 
the direct service they're paying for. You know, and, and there may be some markets where advertising is sufficient enough to, you know, to, to sustain and grow your business on the back of ad dollars. But the trends and reality just don't sustain that idea, that thought. You know, we just see the ad, the ad models aren't there to sustain the majority of media outlets out there today. And another interesting note, a paywall brings a certain level of accountability in journalism. You know, when you have people actually paying, you know, kind of right, you know, with just an advertising model, you're having to uh, do all you can to really pump those clicks and those views up so you can go back to your advertisers and say, look, this is, look at these numbers, you know, these are the kind of uh, engagements that you can have and that sort of thing. But when you have a paywall and people are paying, now you stop thinking about so much your advertiser, but you start to shift. It's a subtle psychology change, but it, there's a shift in your focus that now we're going to see what kind of how we can improve our journalism to support our paying subscriber base you know so there's something there's a shift that happens there that can bring value to your business will people pay well i've seen it i've seen a lot a number of business like i said the one i, me I mentioned a moment ago they're in business today because they decided to ask they decided to ask. We've already seen that more and more people are willing to pay the, the subscription economies here. The percentage of people subscribing to content is going up. And let me uh, give you a little case study here. A, um, a client did a poll to see what, what their, before they set up the paywall, what would you be willing to pay? And so what they did, they asked, they asked, they asked this question in the context of three different prices. Would you be willing to pay this dollar amount, this dollar amount, and this dollar amount. And then they left up each price amount. Now, each one, they didn't see the, the people taking the poll didn't see all three prices at once. They just saw one of the prices, OK? And so once the, the margin of error got to 1%, then they, they stopped the poll. And so here's what they found. The percentage of those willing to pay, um, you got 295, 595, and 995. They said, if, if we, they couldn't get enough to, to agree to pay the $3, that it wasn't sustainable. And they were amazed to see that there was, there was the, the percentage of those who said yes, they would pay for the $6 or the $5.95, which is double, was sustainable for them. And so what really shocked them, good thing I'm almost done. Oh, I have to plug in. What really shocked them is that as how close that 995 was. Look at that. Less than 2% difference in those who would be willing to pay 10 bucks for their service. They ultimately decided to go for the mid-range, and they actually launched here recently, and um, so the subscriptions are just going daily, 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 daily. So they're doing really well uh, with that research. And, you know, let's not forget we have the soft paywall, we have the metered paywall, we have that long sales funnel. You could do interval paywalls where, you know, get a name and email, uh, you get two pages or three pages, name and email, you get five more pages, that kind of thing. There's, there's a longer sales funnel that you can have in those kind of paywall models. Don't be afraid to push out the big things, you know, public service announcements. Make sure those get out in front of the paywall. People will love you for it and they'll come back. And when those are out in front of the paywall, they will click around and they'll say, hey, you know, I'm just going to subscribe to this. You know, different ways you can do that. The fact is that we need you to exist. We need journalism to exist. A study came out this year in 2018 by the University of Notre Dame and the University of Illinois at Chicago, right here, um, hometown Chicago. And the report connected greater government abuses to areas without local news reporting services. The report indicated that the chain of awareness begins with the uh, local news, reporting agencies, state services pick it up, and what happens is change happens for the good, for the good, because you exist. And I won't go into all the study. Uh, it was Bloomberg, actually, I believe it was, who reported on it. I, have the, I should have put the source up there. But the, the interesting thing was these organizations without, or these places without local news in their community, you know, the tax rates were higher. They noticed that there was a, a definite comparison that government were, governments were charging more, and it was, there was a correlations made. Very interesting study. Well done. So 
we need you guys to be communicating these things to your, your audience, saying, listen, this is, this is what it would be like. These are the communities without local news. This is what it would be like if we didn't exist. There is a certain checks and balance that journalists and local news organization, organizations bring to a society that's much, much needed. And we've seen that the rise of the internet correlates directly with the loss of news jobs. The US Department of Labor cites that 2001 to 2016, there was uh, a, the, the jobs went from 412,000 in 2001 down to 174,000 to 2016. So a significant drop in the jobs in the news industry. And as we've seen, much of the loss, much of the uh, struggle is often tied to a failing ad revenue model. And it's just, it's, it's a fact of life. And so we have to come up with experiments. So we have to try things that, that will fill the gap. But more importantly, a psychological paradigm shift that allows for your community to get behind you. And yeah, donation-based, sometimes you have to give a little nudge. Not as hard of a nudge as we saw at the beginning of your presentation. If you don't do this or else, you know. But we've seen that the ad revenue models just are not sustainable. So it's, in it's time to embrace the subscription economy. It's here, it's growing. We don't see any trends otherwise. Um, a paywall with a balanced and open, a balance of, of open and premium content will actually strengthen the open web, allow for content that is quality uh, to be, be put out there, the checks and balances that need to be there because local journalism exists. They're not shutting their doors because they didn't, they didn't ask for support. They didn't put up uh, some sort of monetization model on their journalism. If you aren't here, if you aren't there, um, who's going to take your place? It's got to be something, it's got to be, we need the journalist, journalists of the world out there. You know, and someday society may look back and say, we should have supported local journalism, but they didn't ask. But they didn't ask. So I'm encouraging you guys to ask. And I'll leave you with this final thought from our, uh, an American founding father here, Benjamin Franklin. A Bible and a newspaper in every house, a good school in every district, all studied and appreciated as they merit, are the principal support of virtue, morality, and civil liberty. Thanks. So thank you uh, to both Eric and Nick uh, for, those, for those presentations. Uh, if you guys want to just come back up to the front here, we got about 20 minutes uh, for questions. So how we're going to run this is if you just raise your hand and, and you all can call on somebody, we're going to try to run mics in the aisles so that um, everybody in the room can hear you and we can also uh, hear you on the video. So um, yeah, questions for, for Eric and Nick. Or if you want to throw tomatoes at us. That's tomatoes fine. are good. I like tomatoes. One right here. Um, I'm actually from the Boston Globe. Boston Globe, yes, yeah. I see that. Um, awesome. Uh, you mentioned a lot about, uh, obviously, paywalls. And we've done a lot of experimentation there um, in that world and um, uh, learned a lot of lessons in different ways. Uh, I just wanted to add a, a comment about the, the, the mention of churn. And uh, there's churn there, there will uh, we, we've found that their churn will always be there and it's uh it's not just about uh audience growth it's also about audience retention um and we have also found that uh churn uh in uh the digital realm is much lower than the churn we've had in the print realm um and as a result, we've, we've obviously been pushing for more digital subscriptions, but uh, that is one of the reasons why as well. Now, just out of curiosity, do you allow people to cancel online? No. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but, <laughs> but yeah.
Uh, I've uh, uh, spoken with some people actually at my hyper local newspaper, you know, and they have a readership of around uh, 20,000. I don't know if you've uh, uh, seen anything with, you know, if there's even room you know, in the future for those really small publications, but how with such a different model that has traditionally been on the hyper local advertising that just doesn't have the revenue anymore, how, what that looks like with paywall? I, yeah, I guess I can answer uh, to that one. We've seen, um, we've seen our most successful clients in hyperlocal markets. Um, it's just that the fact is the, the, the competition for the content is not usually there as much. There, are, there may be some competitors in the market, but uh, when you set up a paywall, uh, some sort of paid content or paid, monet, you know, paid monetization for your content, uh, for access, you have um, what they don't have, you know, you know if, if grandma wants to know what the score was for their grandson, you know, and they weren't there, or maybe they're even out of town, or they live elsewhere, you're the only source. You know, they can't go to the Boston Globe to find out what their, how their grandson scored at the, at the ball game, you know. Um, or even see the pictures. So there's a certain um, there's a certain uniqueness that hyperlocals can bring that um, set up an environment which is, is much better for a paywall. And just to add, there is um, also in the Lindfest Institute data, uh, there's no correlation between uh, the size of a publisher and the price that they charge. So you, would, you might think that say, a New York Times could get away with charging a higher price than a hyperlocal, but in fact, when you think about sort of what is the value to me as a, as a person living in that community, that hyperlocal has a lot of value. Yeah. Um, I love the emphasis on charging for the service and not the content itself, just as a general principle. What I'm curious about, without like talking about your, either of your companies specifically, um, one of the problems I see in this space in general, especially for hyper-local, is the ac accessing the tools and the resources to implement like best practices, like microtransactions, like a long time ago, was very inaccessible for most folks, right? It was like a high-level experiment that required large dev teams to be able to pull off. So I'm curious if you can speak to like the state, when you look at the industry as a whole, if, regardless of your own companies, what, what's the state of the accessibility of these best practices and the ability for hyperlocal to experiment with different models? Because I presume that that's been a blocker, that it's these these are experiments that are accessible to only you know specialty teams and organizations with large resources. Is that changing? What are you noticing, like trend wise? I would say that there is first off, there are a lot of resources these days, including some of the organizations I mentioned. But there's also uh, local online independent news. There's a number of organizations that are sort of banding together and trying to uh, get, say, economies of scale of multiple publishers together to, say, to bargain for uh, better licensing fees and things like that for certain products. But, uh, but I would say there's a lot more, just more information these days than there was before. Yeah, I think the I think the, the the tools are definitely. Of course, you know, time has gone by, and, and people are developing uh, tools to make make it more accessible for for those kinds of uh, objectives. Um, so, but I, I, again, I think it comes back around to um, you know, we've seen a. It's I'm not going to say it's a winner, but it's certainly a contender. You know, the meter has kind of kind of solidified itself as a leading uh, model in the market for companies who are wanting to set up some sort of paywall. And in the meantime, I know there are people, there are organizations that are looking at trying and experimenting with different things. Um, but in the meantime, you know, you have the, the, the meter, which is doing, doing pretty well in, in, in certain markets. And, um, you know, they're, they're, the tools are, are, are there for companies to kind of ramp up pretty quick. Oh. They felt like there weren't really, like, is that an excuse anymore, or is it more now philosophical? Or... Yeah, no, there's a, number of, there's a number of organizations out there, including his and mine, you know, in that, in that pool, that can quickly ramp up these models for companies. So, yeah, I don't think access to tools is, no, is the issue. It's, you know, what, how much do you want to charge, what kind of model, how, far, how long of a lead-in, you know, in the soft paywall do you want to do, are we doing micropayments on demand? You know, those, those are the questions that we're trying to answer, I think, right now. We got one in the, in the back row there.
I'm reading the work that our competitors are doing, what I see is that they're sometimes monetizing events, and they're also monetizing research that they're selling frequently, and I wanted to hear your thoughts on how that might fit into this model. Events are definitely a strategy that we've seen a lot of publishers. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking primarily from the sort of major metro newspaper space, but even in that world, which is fairly general interest, um, events are a, a, a big area where there's a lot of activity, right? So a lot of publishers are finding that within certain areas that they are acknowledged experts in in their communities, they're able to convene, to use their convening power to get people together and make money not just from uh, so sponsorships of events, but also from sort of direct sales to, uh, to people who want to come. I could tell you a story. Um, there is an organization in Australia who is in the pharmaceutical industry, um, and they do news for in, in that industry. And uh, they came to us and they said, well, um, you know, we've, been, we've had this, this wall up for a while, and we've got a number of subscribers. We're thinking about doing an event. And... Uh, um, and they kind of told us what they want to do, and he said, "Well, let's let's pre-sell, let's let's get some, let's get a couple speakers locked in." And so we kind of worked with them on, on a couple of things, and uh, set a time, and let's pre-sell, see what happens. I remember the day that um, they launched the event. the uh, The owner called me and says, "Nick, I just I think I feel we're only got like two or three people that are going to jump onto this because it's it, I do, I just I'm really nervous about this." I said, well, let's see what happens. <clears throat> well, they made six figures within like two weeks um, because of the event. And it was just like, it, it totally it blew their mind that they got so much community interest, uh, but they had built a, a good platform for about two years of, of, of engaged users through their website, and through their content, and, and, and the majority of them were paying users. Um, but, but, and yeah, so it was, I, I know in that particular scenario, um, they didn't do events before. They tried one. I know they're planning another one now. So it was really a good success for them. Any last question? Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask about what you see um, the role of like ownership on the subscriber or reader um, in supporting uh, journalism and publications because. Uh, I agree that we're getting used to paying for subscriptions, but I think like one thing that's really different about supporting like a local um, paper, like like here there's something like Black Club Chicago, which just uh, started um, off of Civil actually, which is really cool. But like on Spotify, it's like, are you really supporting the artists? They're making pennies on the, like they're they're not even making that much money really. Uh, but with something. Um, like uh, a, a subscription, like for me with like the New York Times or something, like I feel like I identify a little bit. Like it's almost like um, donating to like a nonprofit or like supporting a cause or like you're doing it out of like your own values too. So I was like wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about like identity or like ownership on the subscriber part. Well, I would say that the certainly the ownership of an organization makes a difference in what the stated sort of goals of that ownership are. Um, but we've seen in the, at least in the newspaper world, uh, both you know, for-profit models and non-profit models uh, succeeding at asking people to, to pay for content, and in, in, in a variety of different ways, both the, you know, the Guardian with the sort of the open model and uh, my alma mater in Philadelphia, which is actually now owned by a nonprofit, but uses a more traditional paywall model. Um, and I, I, I would say, yes, there's, I'm sure there's a concern that if I were, you know, if I were subscribing to Spotify, say, that, that I would assume that not much of the money that I pay is actually going all the way to the content creator. But if I'm subscribing to most publishers, uh, I can feel pretty good about knowing that uh, a large part of the, the money that I'm spending is actually supporting the content creation. I think, and, and to answer that in the publishing world, I think the challenge that you, one would have is, is, is subscribing to media content through somebody like, um, you know, like Apple or Google, where they have their, their percentage, their cut is really huge, you know. Um, so if, you're, if, you, if there are companies that have direct, model, you know, direct uh, paywalls on their content, um, you know, that aren't, that don't have a platform, like a, a, a big platform in between them, 
um, usually majority of the, the, those revenues are going towards that organization, you know. So. Cool. Any last questions? Yeah, right here. So, Eric, in your talk, you called out uh, how a lot of publishers, to remove paywalls, uh, you have to go through a phone call, which has a discussion, and there's a, a, big, a bit of a, a fun opportunity that happens to go back and forth, that looks like. Sure. So it's, it's like canceling a gym membership, where you have to hustle, and you go through this whole process. So my question for you is, is there a way, maybe as an industry, since we have a bunch of people in the room who might be able to brainstorm or think about this, to think about maybe a better way to be able to sign up and unsubscribe from different kinds of models. Because personally, like I love so many great people who do great things. Like for example, I love the Boston Globe, right? Like I would love to be able to subscribe, but maybe there's something, maybe for some reason I don't want to subscribe to them. Like, is there a simpler way for us as an industry to propose maybe a different model to being able to join or unjoin um, these kinds of organizations? And I'd love to, since you guys both have, I think, different thoughts on this, I'd love to hear from both of you. Great question, um, and you just reminded me that I need to cancel my gym membership because I never use it. No, nope. uh, <laughs> but but uh, you know I, I I think part of what what is so interesting about this California uh, thing that's happening is that it, it, that may be a result, right? The fact that we're you know California is going to make it a lot harder for publishers to make it hard for people to cancel, and so we might end up in a place where. There's this really sort of rapid, you know, sign up, cancel, sign up, cancel uh, mentality among users. For you know, I'm going to sign up for a few weeks to get uh, whatever, or maybe I'm traveling. I want to you know visit Boston and and just take take the paper for a few weeks. I don't know, but but that you know, this makes that possible, which I don't think really was a situation before. Um, but I'd love to hear other thoughts. Yeah, I I, I think I think. Um, the more transparent you, the organizations are with their customers about, hey, if you want it, pay for it, but we're going to make it easy if you don't want it. I think really that's, that's kind of up to the tools and the organizations to say, yeah, if you don't want this, we don't want to hold you over a barrel, you know, make, make it possible for them to cancel. We found that, um, I'll tell a personal experience, I know back whenever, the, the, the day that I signed up for the seven-day trial to Netflix, I was like, I'm probably not going to keep this. I'm just going to try it out for my kids. I think it was like one of my kids like saw an advertisement for something that was running on Netflix, and I said, okay, we'll get a seven-day free trial. You can watch it for a few days. and we'll, um, I forget how long ago that was, but yeah, I'm still a <laughs> subscriber. I, you know, we enjoyed the content. The content, was, it worked. And if the content's good, we often find that people get in the door and they're using it, and they're using it, and there's no problem with that paying on their account every month, you know, because they like it. But if they're not happy, you really don't want unhappy customers. What I would suggest is, you know, when you see those churn, we have a, we have a tool that, you know, lets, that kind of lets people see the accounts that churned out and provide an opportunity for them to communicate with the customer. And we encourage our, um, our clients to, to communicate with those who churned out to see why to help them understand. Of course, there are built-in ways that you can find this out at the point of canceling. You can ask the question, you know, what are your reasons and that, and that thing. Some people just, you know, aren't interested anymore, or maybe it's, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a financial reason or something, you know. So getting feedback is really critical to making, you know, your next decision uh, or adjustment to the, the monetization model. And again, it's the, the important thing here, the, the underlying concept here is your connection with your audience. That is the real value here. You're not having, you know, the, it's no longer the advertiser you're trying to appease, but you're actually talking with directly with your community, and that's, that's who you are. That's, that's the value that you can bring. So. I'm just curious if there are other thoughts on that, on that point. Right, it makes the notion of retention so much more important than it maybe is today, where we have these sort of artificial things that, that retain customers. Um, yeah, I like that point. Similarly, I was going to add, um, one of the barriers sometimes is the, will I be able to cancel? Totally. Right? Yeah. Like, that's, that's a, 
that's a factor as well. It's like, will I actually be able to, like, if you make it easy for me to know that I can cancel, I'm more likely to actually subscribe, at least for me personally. I suspect others as yeah. well. Yeah, that's a good point. Real good point. Uh, this sounds like a pretty good on-conference to topic if anybody hasn't put it on the board yet. <laughs> Great. <laughs> oh, we got one. Be, it would just be incredible to be able to, as a reader of content, as someone who works in the content space, to be able to go and at the same place where I could subscribe to the New York Times, unsubscribe to the LA Times, or subscribe to the Chronicle, and then unsubscribe to the Chronicle, mm. or subscribe to the Tribune, or unsubscribe to the Tribune. And so, like, I think about it this way, right? Like, if we have the freedom and the agency to do things, like we can do things on Twitter or Facebook, yeah. with paywalls, people might actually be able to do it. But because we introduce friction, I think that's the big problem here, right? Well, like, we as an industry have chosen to make friction our, our, our key mechanism. That's not a, a good thing, I think. I, I would suggest that maybe we haven't consciously chosen that as an industry, but that's the situation that maybe we've fallen into because we respect and we value that direct relationship with the customer too much. If we were willing to give away some of the control to some kind of thing that would, as you described, let us uh, let a user subscribe and unsubscribe to all these different services from one sort of central thing, that might be a win for everybody. But I don't know what that thing looks like or who runs it. That's a really good, yeah. That would be. Perhaps, yeah. Um, the, so Brave is the, the web browser that is sort of looking at this notion of attention and, and actually putting a value on people's attention and then allowing people to use that value to pay. Um, I don't know enough about Brave to know whether that is entirely the, the solution, but it definitely is an interesting approach to the problem. 